Please help me in welcoming our moderator for this session, Mr. James Lloyd, Senior Director, International Trust Pay. Let's have a huge round of applause and welcome him. Very, very warm welcome to you, sir. Welcome, sir. Please help me in welcoming our elite set of speakers, Ms. Mridula Ayer, MD and Head Asia. South Treasury and Trade Solution City Bank. My very warm welcome to you. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Vishal Dalal, CEO, International Markets, Bismo. Very, very warm welcome, sir. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Omar Halabi, Director, Technology, Payments, MEA, Amazon. Let's have a huge round of applause for him, please. Please have been welcoming Mr. Sandeep Indurkar, CEO, Resilient Payments Private Limited, a Bharat Pay Group company. Very, very warm welcome to everyone once again. So, over to you. Great. Well, listen, thank you very much. And um, as you can tell, Madrula and I used to work together. So as soon as I came up, she said, you're in the wrong seat, you need to move. So that, that, that was our working relationship. I'm glad to see it's continued. Um, Delighted to be here, very illustrious panel. Uh, so, you know, I want to do a brief introduction myself. I'll talk a little bit about the panel, and then I will ask each of the panelists just to give a very brief introduction as to who they are, and in particular their coverage. Because I think I'm very pleased to see such a full house. Because when I look at the title of, of driving trends in payments, that's about as high level as you can get. And I promise you, we're going to get into a little bit more detail than that. And specifically, what I'd like to cover in this session will be. I think we're all pretty familiar with the um, tremendous innovation and success story of the kind of India payments landscape over the past number of years. And we, you know, we, can, we can kind of reiterate that a little bit, but ultimately the focus here today will be, okay, what are the implications perhaps for other regions, for other markets? What are the lessons learned, the insights, and so on and so forth? So hopefully that'll be of interest. Um, as I said briefly, uh, my name is James Lloyd. I, I am on brand today. I, I messaged the JustPay team yesterday and said, hey, can I, get, can I get some swag? So I just joined the JustPay team about six weeks ago. Many of you will know, you know, one of India's leading fintechs, payment infrastructure players. But by way of background, I, I was with Citi before that. I was an MD at Citi. I was a partner at EY before that. I was an early stage, growth stage uh, fintechs prior to that. So very much in the payment space, but ultimately kind of multi-region, multi-market. And what's been striking for me, of course, over the past 10, 15 years has been 10 years ago, if you were to ask someone in, in Europe or the US or, or, or even perhaps in Southeast Asia, well, what, how much do you know about the Indian payment landscape? How, how much do you know about the innovation there? Honestly, I don't think people would have known all that much. These days, it is a case study, right? It is, you know, we'll talk a little bit about Latin America, we'll talk about the Middle East and elsewhere, where you have regions, you have markets, you have governments, you have regulators who are seeking to replicate aspects of that success story. Um, and, and for me, I think that's, that's super energizing, and obviously that's, that's been a key component of, of my joining JustPay as well. Sales pitch over. Let me please ask each of our illustrious panelists for a brief introduction as to who they are and also their kind of geographic remit, and, and we can take it from there, please. Yeah, thank you, James. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mridula Ayer. I'm a career city banker more than close to three decades with city in India. My latest remit is I manage the treasury and trade solutions business for Asia South. And now Asia South covers the India subcontinent of India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. Uh, Singapore and the ASEAN countries. So, have been associated with the payments world for um, close to two decades now. So, very excited uh, to see all the disruption and the innovation that is happening. And pretty excited to be at GFF again this year. Thank you. Hello, hi. Hi, everyone. This is Sandeep Indurkar. Uh, I'm currently working with Bharat Pay, and my remit here is to drive growth and detail payment uh, across India. And uh, primary focus is on small businesses and uh, financial inclusion. Uh, prior to Bharat Pay, I worked with ICC Bank almost uh, for 18 years. And uh, it was throughout in the digital channel space. And I had watched the digital uh, journey of India very closely and also worked very closely with NPCI uh, in the entire thing what we are seeing here, right? So, I am very, uh, what to say, happy to be here and uh, in a good panel discussion, which is actually near to my heart, uh, driving digital trend. Excellent. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Vishal Dalal. I have the honor of leading Pismo. For those of you who don't know us, uh, we are a core banking and card issuing solutions provider. 
Our claim to fame is that we were recently acquired in a blockbuster transaction by Visa in January this year. Uh, our other claim to fame is we were chosen last year as the uh, city's global core banking system across 75 countries. Uh, I've been with them for about three and a half years. I've had the honor of sort of leading them, uh, you know, outside Brazil where uh, we were born originally. Uh, and I've been with Prismo for three and a half years. Before that, I was partner at McKinsey and Company for about 12 years. I'm getting old now, so I don't remember much. Uh, and before that, I implemented uh, legacy platforms like core banking solutions and card solutions in Citibank and Barclays. So like many of us, I have a city legacy. Mm. Pleased to be here. Any city legacy, Omar, with you? <laughs> Other than using city cards. But, uh, my name is Omar Halabi. I have the privilege of leading the technology function for Amazon Payment Services. We're a leading payment service provider in the Middle East and North Africa region. We operate across nine different countries. I've been in this role for about five years. So our, our basically our aim is to provide uh, merchants basically with uh, payment solutions that they can offer to their own customers that are seamless and trusted um, to power their businesses uh, online. I also manage technology for all our stores in the MIA region. So that includes uh, UAE, Saudi, uh, Egypt, as well as Turkey and South Africa. Excellent. So I, as I said, an illustrious panel, and I, I think we've got quite a lot to get into. Um, I did say we wouldn't relitigate the, the Indian success story, but I think it's probably worth uh, double clicking on a little bit after which we will get into, okay, what does this mean for other regions? And I, I know, Sandeep, given you know, your own experience, um, both in your prior role and today, I guess trying to think of it from an international lens, because I think we, obviously we've had a lot of domestic focus as part of GFF, as, as, is, as is correct, but then thinking about it from an international lens as well, can you talk us through, if you were to explain to you know, an outsider, as it were, be they in the US or, or Europe, who didn't have much understanding of the Indian story of the past 10, 15 years. Can you give us that kind of background and context <laughs> to help set it in, in, a, in a story for, for an international audience? Yeah, so uh, what I will do is, actually, I, uh, the 18 years journey with ICC Bank is quite relevant. Uh, the, the, I, uh, like the initial stage, 2005, right, there was a drive off uh, digital channel, internet and mobile banking. That was uh, the uh, platform which all the banks were actually driving. The idea of the focus was mainly to see how we are able to move transactions from call centers and branches uh, to internet banking. And uh, it was basically a cost center. You just keep the uh, it was basically a cost center at that point in time. And slowly banks started moving more transactions uh, into self-service mode and getting customer acquisition also from the internet and mobile banking started uh, partnering with aggregators and giving net banking payment gateway and we're trying to monetize uh, this platform and slowly this uh, platform become uh, profitable and uh, in fact uh, the first mobile banking application was launched in 2008 and uh, around after that in 2009 RBI came with mobile banking guideline and that was the era which was actually what I can say is could be a foundation stage for digital payment. At, at this stage, a uh, lot of telecom players wanted to enter into digital payment space. Uh, quite a, a few people will be knowing in 2009 Vidya Valan ad came for Airtel, uh, where, they, where actually a lot of people realized that they, will be, they, they can transact on mobile. And uh, Vodafone MPS a success story in Kenya was already there and Vodafone wanted to do something in India. Uh, similarly, Nokia was there, they wanted to do Airtel, everybody wanted to get into the payment space. Uh, and bank were actually partnering with them and uh, forming some sort of a BC arrangement and they were sourcing customer uh, for the bank, could be a prepaid instrument that was the most popular uh, instrument which was given at that point in time, wallet uh, and uh, saving account also, where the access channel will be of telecom players, whereas uh, the account were of the bank. That was the model uh, quite prominent at that point in time. IMPS was launched and which was actually uh, making a, trans a fund transfer instantaneously. Within seconds, you were able to transfer fund and that, that's where uh, the excitement started to begin. Uh, Aadhaar was also launched during that point in time. To that extent, onboarding uh, to the, uh, of merchants or customers became easy to that extent. And then the stage came 
whereby uh, what I can say will be ex a transformation stage where UPI got launched. UPI is again a simple fund transfer mechanism through mobile. But the difference, what was there in UPI was, it has actually removed the dependencies of the bank. Earlier, customers were very dependent on bank for getting an access channel. Right? Unless and until your bank is providing your mobile banking platform, you are not able to transact on mobile banking. Unless uh, you go as a, open a separate account with, uh, uh, take a prepaid account or wallet with any telecom player and do, and that was also limited. But this UPI, whereby any fintech can become a PSP player, can become a TPAP, and they were able to give the customer the experience they want, and it was very focused on payment, while bank was focused on a lot of other things, right? It is uh, deposit, CASA, everything. Uh, it was very focused on payments, and it was al they were also incentivizing customer to make the payment, and that's, that's where the entire digital payment started happening, and that has actually revolutionized the payment. And the, uh, the, now the, what I can say is uh, the current stage, what is basically is an expansion stage, whereby NPCI is the way they are driving UPI. They are continuously improvising uh, on the same product, right? And let's, and let's pause there for a second, because I do want to come back to what maybe the future of that looks like. But, but, but thinking about that journey, and maybe, Madrula, from your perspective, right? City, obviously, one of the biggest global transaction banks, coverage all over. At, at what point, and I guess at the time, City would have had a retail presence here as well. At what point did it become clear that, you know, UPI or the India story was going to be significant in terms of not just the domestic growth, but also potentially, if we think about instant payment platforms in other markets and so on, like, how does City as a global transaction bank think about the market? Yeah, so let me just step back a bit, uh, James, because when, when we looked at uh, any innovation in any space, I think innovations have been successful when they are actually solving for a real world problem or they are adding tremendous value to the ecosystem participants. And if you can commercialize that innovation at scale, then even better, right? So when you look at what banks like City have been doing, and I can't say only banks, I think today fintech players are a very important part of this ecosystem and the way payments have developed in this country, they have a very big role to play as well. When you look at what banks and fintech players have been doing, and especially in the UPI context as well, we've taken these innovations and made it real for our customers. So you take the payment innovations if you talk about it and then package it in such a manner that it becomes relevant for our clients, right? Now, what do I mean by that? Let me just explain it with a very simple example. Suppose you have a business enterprise which just wants to make a payment instantaneously, right? Of course, we have UPI, IMPS payment rails in this country, and that's very much possible. But unless the business enterprise is connected to the bank in an equally instantaneous manner, the end-to-end -end payment is not going to be instantaneous, right? So what you then, you have API technology or other forms in which you integrate with the business enterprise. So this is where I think banks like City are playing a very important role. Um, as you mentioned, as City, of course, we operate in 95 countries. So we do have the advantage of looking at companies and businesses across multiple countries and industries. And while there are some nuances, largely the problems faced by companies is not very different. So an auto company in Mexico will have similar problems as auto companies in China. Or a pharma company in India is not going to have very different problems from pharma companies in the US. So what we have seen is that the problem statements are pretty similar across clients. And therefore, I think our role as banks become very important in how do you package the solution, the innovation that exists in every geography. And mind you, every country is doing payment innovation in some form or the other, right? And, and make it relevant to our customers. Another important thing, I guess, which banks and fintechs are able to see is the use cases that are emerging. Um, India, of course, yes, but even globally, we are seeing multiple use cases which have taken good shape in the last few years, right? Like the gig economy. We all have sort of ordered a cab in the past or we have like ordered food, but this whole platformization has made it like a super economy at this point with close to $400 billion in size, right? Likewise, there is e-commerce. Likewise, there are retail clients who were operating in the offline space, 
but now are wanting to go into the online space and this has opened up a completely new set of client base for them. So that is another important trend which I think banks like us who have the vantage point of operating in multiple markets, we are able to see the different use cases that are emerging. Got it. No, I mean, I think for sure you have the commonalities of, of use cases and problems and sectors, but I guess at an infrastructure level, you're obviously seeing those differences in terms, yes. of, in terms of the rails. And maybe in your role, you mentioned in terms of your coverage for Southeast Asia as well. Like, are you seeing, um, I mean, just at a high level at least, are there learnings that, that some of these markets are taking from the India experience? Is Absolutely. Multilateral? Yes. So as you, as you see across, like, if I speak closer to home about Asia, and ASEAN countries specifically. I think each of these countries are at different stage of evolution in their payment journey, in their digital journey, right? Now, India, of course, has got this formula pretty right. I think it is a lot of good planning, good strategic execution, very meticulous execution. Uh, they have laid the foundation with Aadhaar, and then on top of that, the Jandhan accounts, and then you built an open stack that really allowed a lot of ecosystem participants to come in and innovate at scale. Uh, also important factors were built in like fraud, customer dispute resolution. As we look at countries operating in other parts in APAC, really the ASEAN markets, you can see that they have actually taken a lot of learnings from the India ecosystem on how payment has evolved in India. And we are very familiar with that because a lot of central banks have asked us to facilitate discussions, presentations, even meetings with the regulators, etc. So as we look at how prompt pay in Thailand is, has taken place, or when we look at the faster payments ecosystem in Indonesia or Vietnam, you can see that all of the elements of how the India digital ecosystem has evolved, there are a lot of elements of that that you can see, right? And I think it is important for regulators and central banks and payment schemes to learn from each other, and that's the only way to kind of innovate at scale. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, even from personal experience, I can say that I, I feel like the Indian ecosystem, be it RBI, MPCI, et cetera, participants, have always been very open, right? I mean, there is a lot of kind of multilateral engagement and so on and, and kind of lessons learned. And may, maybe, Vishal, specifically on that, because I know PISMO, I, I appreciate you cover international, but PISMO is headquartered in Sao Paulo. Obviously, it, these days, if, if, if one works in the payment space, if you mention UPI, you probably need to mention PICS as well. Um, would you mind giving us a little bit of a sense for those who are less familiar with, with the kind of the, the landscape in Latin America and then maybe pick specifically? Yeah, look, I think first of all, you know, in general, you're absolutely right. In general, when you talk about, you know, mass payment systems uh, which have sort of almost changed the social landscape, you generally tend to mention UPI and PICS, right? I think a lot of the other countries are still evolving, but uh, you generally tend to talk of these two. Maybe There's a lot in common. You know, first is that obviously both of these have been um, harbingers of drastic social change, right? I mean, when I first went to Brazil, when I sort of took on this role, I could see what effect PIX had had on the streets, right? You know, a street vendor being able to sort of, you know, use the formalized banking economy, I think that was number one. I think, secondly, the second thing that I saw in common... And, and sorry to interrupt, I mean, I think that in itself, again, huge. taking an outside, outside perspective is huge, and I know it was some of my former city colleagues when I first started coming down, um, I was based in Hong Kong at the time, I'd come down and again, you come from a Hong Kong or, or from an Ireland or the UK or whatever, you know, you're, to Madrula's point, you're dealing with very different yep. problem sets and use cases yep. and here to be, to, to be able to, I don't know, is banking the correct term, but, but to enable, um, you know, micro merchants and individual street soul sellers and so on, I mean, that is transformative, as you said. It's huge, right? It's formalization of the lowest strata of the society into the banking system and that can change the nature of a country's economy. And so, you know, in both cases, we sort of saw it firsthand. I think the second thing, obviously, in common was both made use of a common architecture, which is like the national identification system, right? India had Aadhaar, Brazil had a CPG system, which sort of, you know, exactly the same thing. Um, and after You can't that, have one without the other, realistically. Exactly, you can't, you absolutely can't. And, you know, the good part is these, both these countries have used that very, very well. So in some one, both cases using one as a carrot for the other, right? So, you know, in cases where, for example, national ID uh, was, you know, adaptation was low, you know, the carrot was, you can come into the banking system, right? So both these countries did that very, very well. Um, I think, obviously, after this, India sort of gone much further because it started much earlier. So I think the difference is the product coverage is sort of slightly wider, but my sense is Brazil executes very, very well, right? They, they see what others do and they execute very, very well. So. 
while India sort of took off with normal payments and debit cards and you know then sort of added credit and then credit line and then yesterday lending. Uh, Brazil is sort of, you know, my sense is it's sort of headed that way as well. Very, very sophisticated regulation, very clear about the benefits of the cloud. Obviously, there's one more thing that's in common, and I'm shamelessly going to say it. Uh, Pismo is common to them. We're the only platform which is sort of certified on both of them. And Everybody's allowed one sales pitch per <laughs> exactly. panel. That's okay. <laughs> exactly. But, but I think uh, it has been stunning to see, right, what, what these two have achieved in terms of the role they've played in transforming the economy at the lowest start of society. They've sort of almost reinforced the national ID system, right, and brought the benefits allowed. They've basically said, okay, we're going to use this, we're going to execute this well, and start adding other products onto it. Uh, and more importantly, the way I think India will inspire sort of a lot of, you know, as Mridullah said, a lot of innovation around the region. What PIX does will drive LATAM. Right? And, and we can sort of see that every day. And we know that because we're on the ground, we sort of get approached by regulators, we get approached by regulators saying, hey, you guys are in India, right? You know, can you just tell us what happens over there? Right? Or, or you know, banks basically saying, hey, what features of, you know, of, of sort of uh, what you see in UPI we can incorporate over here? There are some things that Sandeep mentioned which are also sort of very relevant. For example, India sort of started with overall access, right? Independent of banks. Brazil sort of, you know, has started the other way. So it started with bank access. You have to have a bank account to get access to the rails. But my sense is, and I don't claim to speak for them, my sense is they'll go the way India has gone as well. So it's a very self-reinforcing ecosystem, right? Everyone is learning. My sense is when the history of this is written, India and Brazil will sort of be mentioned as the harbingers. And yeah. You know, everyone sort of follows suit from there. And I'd love to talk a little bit in a moment about who, who those followers might be as well, right? Yeah. Because yeah, I do yeah, think, yeah. And, and maybe, Omar, that brings us to, to the Middle East. And, and I want to ask a little bit about Amazon payment services specifically in a moment. But just Middle East generally, if you don't mind, you know, where, where they're at in terms of stage of development. I know there's um, quite, a, quite a number of developments there associated with, obviously, instant payment systems and even, um, you know, uh, card issuance specific to the region and so on. So I think when you look at the Middle East region, it's easy to kind of paint the stroke of one brush sort of to say that all countries are similar, whereas you'll see that every country is in a differing state of, let's say, maturity when it comes to digital payments from countries that have very high adoption of digital payments, like say a, a UAE, to one where uh, digital adoption is still on the lower side, like in Egypt, for example. But I think, you know, tying this back to the, to the topic of the conversation, I think the progress that's been made in India has really been a source of, I would say, inspiration and admiration, really, in the region. And I think India's position itself also as a trusted partner in the region. So you mentioned about the uh, card issuance. So NPCI actually partnered with Etihad Payments, which is the subsidiary of the Central Bank of UAE, most recently, to basically launch the first uh, domestic card scheme uh, in the UAE. Um, and so that was kind of one development. We also see, obviously, you know, learning from UPI and success of PICS, also instant payment rails kind of coming online across the region. So we have an IPP program in the UAE. Uh, we have Saria coming up in Saudi Arabia. There's also IPN networks uh, coming up in, in Egypt. So again, it's still a bit early in the, in the journey, uh, but definitely seeing traction. For example, IPN in Egypt launched initially primarily as P2P, uh, and it's seen tremendous traction there. They're in the process of launching P2M use cases, which will you know, unlock additional use cases and value there. So definitely ways to go, super exciting times in the, in the region. And I think that beyond just the, the technology play in terms of you know, what's happened in other regions, I think the learnings of how you roll these products out so that you can fasten the curve to adoption I think is where a lot of value from the, you know, the learnings from India, from Brazil would come in, both in terms of like feature sets, but also uh, commercial models. How do you get the banks in? How do you get this, the merchant acceptance networks that you need? So I think a lot of that, hopefully as we see these networks roll out, I predict that the, the pace of adoption perhaps will be further accelerated from some of the earlier uh, implementations. Yeah. You know, the one thing, uh, James, as I see across the globe, what I see is that it's not easy to build an infrastructure for the kind of volume that we have in this country. And I think that tech stack that has been created here is like state of the art, right, and of industrial strength. And when we look at payment uh, launches which has happened in other parts of the world, uh, they still struggle with having the kind of uptime that we've managed to have with UPI. So 
clearly, I think there is a lot that countries can learn from how the UPI stack has been built. I mean, I think that's my opportunity for a sales pitch. I mean, obviously, you know, part of the attraction for me of JustPay is actually that operating at scale in a market like this. I do believe there, from a, from a scalability, resilience perspective and so on, there are both lessons to be learned, but also technical implementations to be done elsewhere. So, so I do think that's kind of an exciting aspect. Funnily, uh, Omar, when you're, when you're talking about it and we think about these different regions, I mean, without seeking to um, get too much into the weeds on it, I mean, there is a kind of a geopolitical angle to this as well, which is the importance of payment rails, the importance of infrastructure at a national and then regional level. Um, and I think that's well recognized, even if I think in the European context, you know, a, a number of the stated um, initiatives associated with like the European CBDC, et cetera, is around national ownership of, of infrastructure and rails. That's been a stated. And I think that's kind of implied elsewhere. What does that mean, maybe opening up to the panel? Um, I'm not going to ask about geopolitics, but, but I'm going to ask about interoperability. I'm going to ask about, like, does it mean that we will have PICs and UPI and maybe the, the Middle East and so on and so forth? And then what does that mean when it comes to shared, um, well, not shared infrastructure so much as interoperability and so on? Do we see that as an important driver? Or are we still at the stage of development where, look, these domestic and national schemes are big enough with enough to grow that nobody's really thinking about interoperability just yet? That could be consumer or it could be business, by the way, either. Like, uh, this UPI is going uh, global, right, whereby it is trying and enabling uh, neighboring countries to accept UPI. So I think uh, this is a great move. Uh, the move is important from the point of view is, uh, like when an in, uh, Indian, Indian is actually traveling to you say UAE, he need not have to download a separate app. He will be uh, transacting from his own app. And I think that is very much important because he need not have to learn all the way how to transact with the other things where he's uh, traveling or for any other purpose. So similarly, that is the model which I think uh, will uh, need to be uh, followed globally, like uh, if somebody, Alipay or WeChat person is coming in India, he should be able to transact using Alipay and WeChat, right? Uh, that sort of uh, cross-collaboration and interoperability is, uh, is required. Does that get built by the, the, the schemes, the, the, the infrastructure providers? Is it provided by the banks or fintechs? Is it a mix of the above? Do people have a strong view in terms of a connectivity? I, I think that is a problem as to who will hold it all together, right? So if you look at it, when it comes to cross-border interoperability, there are different sets of people doing their stuff. So it's become like small islands, which is where people have come together, people with the same mindset, as you said, uh, ideologies, etc. Uh, what will end up happening is you'll have these walled gardens, and again, it will not be truly interoperable. So it's, it's going to take some time. Uh, there are efforts being made, both bilateral connectivity and, uh, you know, consortium-based approach. Uh, but it is going to take a considerable amount of time before we break, like, every, all the walls and have a truly interoperable model. But efforts are on. Well, I, I mean, I tend to think about this much more philosophically. And, you know, what I'm seeing, at least in terms of pattern recognition, is payment systems are a perfect reflection of a country's aspirations, right? So if you look at India... Uh, you know, very strong regional power now, an emerging superpower globally, right? And therefore, you will see their expansion plans sort of reflecting that, right? You can, for example, now use UPI in France, right? Uh, you know, you, uh, you can sort of use UPI in many other continents, right? So you can see the speed of that reflecting India's aspirations. If I look at Brazil, right, again, a very regional superpower, very powerful in its own right, the innovator in Latin America, right? So essentially sort of, you know, growing up, you know, building all of the use cases and then showing other countries there how to do it, right? So it reflects its aspirations over there. I think the next generation of countries which do this will figure out the right answer, right? India sort of been a pioneer, so it almost had to do it all on its own, right? Uh, they haven't had the time to sort of seek feedback from other countries because no one else had it, right? Should we build our infrastructure? Should banks do it? Should we privatize it? I think the next generation will sort of have the benefit of learning from India and figure out what the right answer is. And I think the next generation, I mean countries like the US, where for example, Fed now is sort of, you know, starting to take root. Yeah. These are not the traditional countries that you would have thought for, right? US, UK, all of these will sort of come on board. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, I guess we are, I want to talk a little bit about B2B because, I mean, it, it, the kind of inherently we maybe talk about B2C in the case of UPI and so on. 
And even then, as you talk about, let's say, Indian tourists or, or business people traveling overseas, I mean, frankly, we've had this from, you know, JCB card in, in Japan, Union Pay, now Alipay, WeChat Pay. That is a relatively well-trodden path, albeit it might be with a different technology stack in this case. But what about B2B, right? I mean, if the, 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 we're talking about the world is somewhat segmented, but there's still a tremendous amount of cross-border trade. Are there new rails, new infrastructure, new solutions being developed that will be a significant improvement on the way things are, are, are being done today? I mean, maybe Madrid. I, I, see, this clearly going to be the next area of significant growth for, from an India perspective, definitely, right? Um, there is definitely a gap today, e-commerce, exports, if you look at it, it's just about what? three to four billion, it's less than 1% of the merchandise exports that's happening in the country. Compared with China, it's about 250, 300 billion. Global e-commerce is about 800 billion to a trillion. So there is a huge gap. But again, I think we are plagued by the same problems on e-commerce, remittances, uh, cost, speed, visibility. All of these are problems. And today you find that in pockets, banks and fintechs have come together to try and solve it. But the solutions are not yet at scale. So I think everybody is trying to see what they can do best to provide the buyers and sellers a seamlessly integrated solution. Uh, but one important thing is that regulations are a huge enabler from an India context, right? I mean, they are dynamic, they are evolving, and even now the recent regulations which has been launched by the RBI, they allow for e-commerce e cross-border to grow. So it's an area where a lot of work is required, it's fragmented at this point in time, uh, but the regulations are enabling and there's of course then technology which is also helping play a role. I think that's an important point because sometimes again from an external perspective it seems like wow India's kind of solved all these problems and everything but there's still plenty of ways to go. I mean there's still plenty of other use cases and you mentioned too there right the B2B piece but also remittance and I guess Omar coming to you because if I think about obviously your Middle Eastern coverage you know Middle East to India in itself is one of the bigger corridors like how are you seeing remittance as a solved problem from a customer experience perspective or, or infrastructure? Is it solved? Is it not? Maybe whether on remittance and or B2B, thoughts from, from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, as you said, I think uh, when, when you know, look at the top five uh, money transfer corridors, UAE to India is number two and Saudi to India is like number five on the list. So definitely in the top. I think there's definitely still room, like while well, it's definitely improved from say, you know, five, 10 years ago, I think there's still room to improve, particularly when it comes to the convenience aspect and the customer experience in terms of how do you make it as seamless as possible. And also I think from a timing perspective that instantaneous aspect of it uh, can also be enhanced. And I think that's where the rails we've been talking about can help. But I think it's going to take a concerted effort and also the incentives have to be aligned in the, in the right manners for these applications to develop on, uh, on these rails. But I think the opportunity is definitely there. Um, and I think obviously B2B is a much larger uh, even opportunity uh, in that respect, especially when it comes to cross-border. Um, I expect that we will see you know, uh, different sort of, let's call them experiments emerge as basically some of the you know, country to country, point to point solutions get enabled. Um, and I think that th that experimentation will then drive essentially the direction moving forward in terms of how much that expands versus how much it stays more bilateral in nature between uh, different countries. But I think there's, we're still very early on in that journey, I feel, but uh, there's definitely both a big opportunity, but also some of the challenges that you mentioned around regulation, but I would also add like compliance and, and all those other aspects as well. Still have to get from cross-border e-commerce to borderless e-commerce. A long journey. A long journey indeed. And so on that point then, and we have a few minutes left to go, like looking forward, are there either individual systems or platforms or even markets where, where anybody's seeing kind of something new, something innovative, something that could be replicated here or elsewhere? I mean, I kind of briefly alluded to CBDC in the European context earlier, but obviously that's been a, a hot topic for many years now from BIS on down. Is this required? Are there other aspects like that that we think are gonna be meaningful if we're sitting on the stage in five years time? Will we be uh, simply talking about the improvements that we've layered upon the infrastructure that exists today or will we be talking about some entirely new infra? Anyone have um, any views? Uh, so I think, uh, again, taking the five year template, uh, my sense given where we are today, 
I'm not able to yet get a clear picture of whether centralization versus decentralization of blockchain will happen. But I know there are a few common elements which we will definitely see and we'll sort of see it at a much higher level. One which I think no one will really dispute because you know we keep talking to regulators is the cloud. Right? I think I think the cloud is sort of not gonna go away. It'll just get better, faster, stronger, safer. I think that's number one. By the way, let me just come you're right. Sometimes we kind of get ahead of ourselves a little bit and maybe more from the fintech side, yeah. we're kind of like, oh, cloud's a solved problem. It's, it's, it's not a solve for, for not large institutions in particular. But, but in my sense, it'll get better. Second is, we now do, and you know, it wasn't the case earlier, we now do have a global common language, which is the language of APIs. It'll get better, right, but that's not gonna go away. It might get modified, but it won't go away. The third thing is obviously, I guess, the end user device, right? My sense is, we're currently at about 60, 67%, you know, smartphone penetration. I think those will get cheaper, faster, stronger, right? So that's sort of not going to go away, and feature phones will go down. Also an interesting point, because, and, and, and Zeeb, correct me if I'm wrong, but like for, for UPI originally, there was a view that it was going to be feature phones, actually, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And that was a kind of a sign of the time, and then how quickly that technology exactly. advanced. Yeah. Exactly. And, and remember how easy it would have been to have gotten it wrong, right? By not being bold and saying, oh, we don't know when smartphones will take off. But UPI took the right call. And sometimes it needs that boldness of vision to sort of take the right architectural call. Right? That's what makes the difference. So I think those elements are not going to go away. Whether there will be centralization, decentralization, I mean, I see the Bahamas now using, you know, CBDC as a currency. But I think, you know, five years is sort of too short to make a prediction. But the four elements I stated, you know, those are just going to get better, faster, and stronger. Got it. So one thing I want to add here is, actually, the thing is, uh, when we're talking about the smartphone, like we have a 700 uh, million smartphone, but uh, only 400 million are still in the UPI, right? And to that extent, there is now what is, what need to be done to see that the other 300 also come into the into the digital payment, and that is where uh, some problems like anonymity, which is currently because they don't want to come into a formal uh, payment system, right? They, and that is something if it get addressed, like for example, if CBDC is coming and it is actually replica replacing cash, and uh, that anonymity comes, so then there would be these people who are aware and well educated about the digital payment, but they don't want to do digital payment, right? So how we are able to solve that and get them also into this thing, that is, would be again a uh, thing to watch. Okay, so uh, look, I think there's a lot there. I, I'm, I'm personally really interested in the, the kind of lessons learned, the insights, the kind of multilateral engagement that happens around this space. I think it makes it really energizing, right? Because we're solving problems domestically, but then you're also helping solve those problems elsewhere by virtue of, of the example and so on. Um, I think we're at time, so uh, please uh, join me in thanking this really excellent and illustrious panel. Thank you, everybody, for your time.